Okay, so we've gone ahead and gone over all of our deployment. We have this whole solution set up and functioning. We can see traffic between the sites. And to some degree, it's redundant. Uh, from our internet circuit perspective and the connectivity between the sites, we obviously have multiple links and any failure in any link wouldn't create an outage to a site. In addition, West and East have an additional MPLS link between them that would facilitate communication between them. We've discussed how we could also uh, advertise routing to the internet via one site or the other uh, to fail that over as well. However, when we get to this level in the environment, we lose our redundancy, right? If this is a hardware appliance and it fails, gets unplugged, whatever it might be, uh, the site, of course, uh, all from the LAN goes dark. In addition to that, if there were a crash and reboot or something to that effect uh, of the Silver Peak appliance, that would also uh, end in an outage to the site. So in this video, we're going to talk about redundancy in the Silver Peak solution and how that integrates and what options we have to the internet circuits and to some degree to the LAN. Uh, the LAN, of course, being a little out of scope, uh, again, we would obviously want to have some redundancy in the connectivity to our core or our switch. Uh, on the back side to make sure that we don't lose the uplink to the Silver Peak. So as you may have guessed, uh, the obvious answer here is to add an additional Silver Peak. There are some solutions uh, or design scenarios where we have an option of fail to glass or fail to copper uh, outside of routed mode. I'm not going to go into that, but it does exist if the design methodology fits in your environment. So in my scenario here, I want to be able to provide redundancy for both the west and the south sites. Now my problem here is if I go back over to Orchestrator and I take a look at my licensing, we can see I only have five total appliances that I can license, and I'm using four of them. So in my environment, I can deploy one more, and after that, I don't get to do anything else. In this case, I'm going to need six total if I want to leave it the way it is. So unfortunately, hard times on the business. Miami's going to have to go. We're going to close that, that site, and I'm going to deploy a couple of new silver peaks for uh, west and south to become the HA appliances there and we'll walk through the high availability options available to us. So that being said, I'm not going to blow away this whole portion of my lab, but what I am going to do is shut this guy off, go back over to Orchestrator, and here I am going to just simply remove this guy from Orchestrator. And at this point, what we should see here is this device will get removed from Orchestrator and my hierarchy, and the license that it was using should come back to me. So now we notice East went away, it's gone. We reclaim the license, it's available for use again. If I look at my discovered appliances, this is somewhat of a sidebar, we can see I don't have anything new here, but if I go to show denied, I do see that still here. So if I was to turn that back on and it was to come back online, I could bring that back in and it shows it was deleted. So not a big deal. Uh, that way I can put this lab back together later and not have to worry about that. So now I'm going to run away in the background here and I'm going to go ahead and build the redundant silver peaks at these two sites. Um, identical to the process we followed in the first video here, uh, and then I'll come back as soon as they're up and uh, we'll start talking about how we would integrate them. Okay, so we can see now I have my two new appliances in. 
Um, I clearly didn't do a very good job with my naming, uh, as now I've just got a dash one and a, a base. Now I can always go rename these uh, anytime if I want. Um, it will rename the host name on the device and we'll move on. But nonetheless, uh, I brought them in. I did something a little different here uh, to bring these guys online. If I go look at even G, uh, my comment uh, earlier about just making sure that they get internet access, uh, ultimately what I did was I turned DHCP on on the LAN side interface of the existing, and I went ahead and connected the management zero interface up to this new switch I threw in between it and the router so that it would get an IP address and be able to talk out. I did that at both sides. Uh, so now what we'll see uh, when I look at these devices in the interfaces menu is oops, I've got a DHCP address on management zero and nothing else is configured. So I need to make sure to bind my interfaces like we did before, being that this is virtual. We see none of these have MAC addresses assigned. Uh, and get them back into the mix, get their IP addresses on them, etc. So, um, in this case, we're going to go WAN 0. We will assign him 0, 01, WAN 102, and WAN 0. Will be 03. Do the same on the other one. O2. Did I already assign this? Yep, I already assigned this guy 03. So we'll save that. And again, anytime we do those bindings, it's going to require a reboot. So, so we'll go to Administration, Tools, and Reboot, Appliance Reboot Shutdown. But before I do that, I'm going to highlight both of these. And we'll see both of them are listed. And we will give them a reboot. So once these guys are back up, we can see they came back online. I'm going to go ahead and run through the config wizard for West. I already did this once, obviously, when I added it to Orchestrator. But now I want to go back. I, I minimally, minimally configured it. I want to go back and uh, do some updates. So I've got the name. I've got the group. I've got the region, location. Uh, as I mentioned before, this site name now comes into play because if this matches the other one, we're going to know that, hey, we're at the same site. We don't need to build tunnels between each other um, for, for any reason. So if I say next, uh, it's currently sitting in a server mode. We need to go to router mode. I'm going to go ahead and use the template here for a dual internet branch because that's ultimately what it will be and we need to go ahead and start assigning IP addresses. So here I will have 192.168.74.3 and again I didn't plan my IP scheme very well either because today my existing silverpeaks.1 in the core switch is dot two. Um, but Core switch being dot two will be my next hop. Over on this side, my primary ISP link, 72.3. My other silver peak is 72.2. And again, on the second ISP, my other one is 72.3 or 73.2. Um, I'm going to shut these off for now. I don't want it to build tunnels yet, so we'll hold off on the labels. Stateful plus NAT, that's great. And here, same thing, 10 meg, 7 meg, and my 
my next hop. 72.1. Oops, 73.1. Cut that. I'll give it the license here. No need for loopback. Nothing here. I'll have BGP set up here shortly to the core, so we won't have to worry about that. And here, um, I already applied these once, but my BIOS, and in this case, my default group, my routing, and my Pacific date time group. Go ahead and apply. Now that that's done, I need to actually go plug these guys in. So over here, we will say ETH1 goes to the primary ISP. ETH2 goes to the secondary ISP. There we go, got that all cleaned up. So now you can see I'm basically cross-threaded between the new device I built and the old device. And in this scenario, um, back to the first video when we started talking about the ISP links, uh, keep in mind, I've got the relevant IP addresses to do this, right? Uh, both of these interfaces uh, on both uh, Silver Peaks can connect direct to net. So I've given them all their public IP addresses um, and a LAN site address to be ready to start utilizing HA. So what happens next? Well, we're pretty much there. However, we still don't have a way to get traffic to that silver peak. Um, if I was to turn the labels on on those interfaces, this would build the tunnels to the other relevant silver peaks and establish that connectivity. However, the rest of the design very much depends on what your integration to the LAN looks like. Today, I am advertising uh, BGP in and out between the existing Silver Peak and the core. Now, I can bring up a new BGP interface here and set local preference or do any normal network functions here that I want. If I was not using BGP, uh, let's say this was just a default static route um, headed northbound, I can also set up VRRP on the Silver Peaks to a VIP address that they would then, um, you know, float back and forth between them. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'll set up the VIP. Uh, not that I would necessarily need it in this scenario, given that BGP would fail over the routes anyway. So here we're going to assume that this BGP relationship doesn't exist. Uh, we're going to assume that there's simply a default static route coming out of the core pointing at the silver peaks. In that scenario, um, I'm also going to assume that there's another network back here, uh, 192.168.76 uh, network that lives uh, back here in the core that we are going to advertise to the SD-WAN and take a look at. So on our silver peak, we're going to go ahead and search for VRRP. We will look at the west sites. We'll look at this one being the primary. We'll add it. Typical VRRP. Uh, group IDs have to match. Main interface. Uh, virtual IP here is going to be 192.168.74. Oops, 74. Dot Four. Priority will set to 150, so it's higher. Save that. Now on this guy, same thing. Group ID one. Oops, it's got a match. Otherwise, we'll have problems. We'll leave that at 128. Save that. And now, here in a little bit, we should see 
this guy will stay back up. This guy should say master if we've got everything done correctly. And I gave that some time and sure enough, we can see here the uptime. This guy is master, this guy is backup. So in this scenario, I would set my default gateway on the core to dot four. Uh, so one being the physical interface here, three being the physical interface here, and four being, being the VIP, uh, where two is the interface on the router. Again, my uh, IP scheming is not great, right? Typically, I would say one is the VIP, and then two and three are my primary and secondaries, but uh, I grew out of necessity here, I guess. So now that we have that configured, let's go ahead and get our routing taken care of. So again, uh, the ways in which we get routes into the SD-WAN fabric um, is either via some sort of routing protocol and we re-advertise them into the SD-WAN fabric, or uh, we have to do it statically. So in this case, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we will go take a look at the routes for Silver Peak West. We'll edit this guy. I'll add a route. Six, yes, dot zero, and then here our next hop on that route seventy four dot two is the core on land zero. Now we need to keep in mind when we have multiple silver peaks at the same site that we have to be careful of the metric on the SD-WAN at which we're advertising routes. Um, in this scenario, I'll leave this 50. Down here on this guy. Same route. Same next top, plan zero, and I'll set this guy to 60. The lower metric is the better metric. And then lastly, we also better go to our deployment and turn on our labels, because right now we don't have any tunnels. So we can see our wind labels were applied, the tunnels have built, all of our alarms cleared. Now let's go take a look at the routes. So if I click on south up here and look at the routes at south, we can see we have two routes showing up for this 192.168.76 network. One of them has a metric of 50 and one has a metric of 60, both coming from the west uh, the two west uh, silver peaks. So why is this metric important? Well, when we go back and look at our topology, because we're using static routing and by default, assuming that this primary silver peak is online, it holds the VIP address. All of our traffic from anything in the core here is going to come to this silver peak. It is going to go out one of these two ISP links to the other site it is going to come back. If I was to advertise a lower metric for that out of this silver peak here, we would end up with asymmetric routing, right? At this point, it comes out and comes back in a different silver peak. We have ways to help with that, but best practice obviously is to make sure that the asymmetric routing doesn't happen. This gets even more hard to control, I guess you could say, when we're using dynamic routing in the background. I will say that a majority of the silver, well, I shouldn't say silver peak, a majority of the SD-WAN uh, issues that I run into are a result of routing that is happening down in the core of the network 
and not so much a SD WAM thing. It's perceived that way, but it's simply the SD WAM uh, devices doing exactly what they're told to do with the routes that they're receiving from the core. Um, in addition, you know, routing loops where I'm learning routes from another site. Uh, I advertise those into the core. If there's EBGP going on in here, the core then advertises them to this Silver Peak, and it doesn't know any better or hasn't been told any better, and it advertises them out again. Um, you can easily loop up a network in that situation um, with the dynamic routing. So as I mentioned, there are some things we can do about asymmetric flows. It comes in the form of flow redirection. And in order to facilitate that, we need to have a connection between our two silver peaks. By default, it uses the management one interface. And I've, in the background, set that up uh, here for E5 as far as the MAC address bindings and ties are concerned. And in here, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the appliance manager of these two silver peaks. And under configuration flow redirection, we will see our configuration. Like I said, by default, it's using management one. The first thing we have to do is actually assign a valid IP address to the management one interface and turn it up. So here, I'm going to give this a 192.0.2.1 uh, um, private address. We'll do the same thing over here. Only this guy will get 2.2. And then we will go ahead and turn up that interface because it's admin down right now. Same thing on the other silver peak. And now that this is up, we'll go to flow redirection, enable it, add a peer. case my peer is 2.2 over here two one if we refresh here we should see this go into an okay state so I'll pull up this page here, but this kind of explains flow redirection. You can pause or back up and take a look at this and read through it. But it essentially makes the two silver peaks aware of each other's flows so that it knows who's handling, each one knows who's handling what. Um, then it will, you know, deliver flows back and forth between the two silver peaks. Um, to make sure that they stay symmetric uh, as they come in and out of the network. So let's move on to our dynamic routing scenario where we have this BGP adjacency. We need to set up the same BGP adjacency here. And of course, depending on your configurations uh, will depend on 
you know what uh, what AS numbers you use, etc. So, um, you know, in the scenario where I might have a second MPLS that connects to this one, chances are that provider is going to use or expect me to have a different ASN. Um, in that scenario, I would end up with um, you know, a number of different scenarios, I guess. I, if I'm doing BGP to the core, I may have eBGP here, eBGP here, um, or I may be using OSPF internal. Uh, it all depends. In my lab here, I'm using BGP just because, I guess, um, no real apparent reason. Um, so we'll need to set up that BGP relationship here. And of course, configure the neighbor down here in the core on the VYOS router. So let's go get that set up real quick. If we look, our Silver Peak West site has two neighbors. One of them, of course, is PE router being the MPLS. The other one is branch uh, being my core. Um, I can see here I'm 65002 and the core is 65006. My provider is 65001. I'm gonna go ahead and use 65003 as my AS on the West uh, Silver Peak. So here, and I'll just give this the, oops. 74.3 address that is my land side. I will add up here 74.2 off land zero. I believe that was 65006. It will be branch. And by default, I'm going to use these route maps, the VR route maps, uh, for the connection. I'll save that. And here we can see that is now set up on this side. I'm going to go ahead and pause and go configure the uh, BGP neighbor on the VYOS and we'll verify it comes up. So I went ahead and set up my BGP neighbor relationship here. Um, we can see that uh, the neighbor is up and established here on west, still up and established. And let's see what this did for us. So when I now look at my routes at west and sort based on my subnet, we will see that I am learning the 105 network from the south as well as the 104 um, this one just saying hey we south learned this from bgp uh, thus the the rest of the bgp information here if i go over to west and i look at this we're going to notice that now i'm learning this 105 network both from south which is winning uh, administrative distance 15 metric 70 I'm also learning it from the core, so it's uh, obviously being you know sent from the uh, Silver Peak one, uh, the the primary down to the core and then back to me. Um, a bit of an issue there. I, obviously, it's doing exactly what it says, but what effect does that have on South? Well, over here, if we look at our 105 network, we have an EBGP connection, administrative distance of 20 and 70, and we're also learning it, even though it's local to us, from the West 1 Silver Peak. So that is not ideal. So this is a little looped up, right? Um, we definitely don't want uh, to be learning our local routes from another Silver Peak. In this scenario, we would ultimately end up using typical BGP features to 
fix this issue, right? Uh, again, I mentioned before, most of the SD-WAN related issues I've faced are not really SD-WAN issues, but more or less route table issues, routing issues. So in order to fix that um, for the West site, what I would ultimately do is go in and set up a route map that denied the redistribution of routes that weren't local to this site. And we have to keep in mind that this is both inbound and outbound. Um, we want to make sure that the routes that we're learning are only routes from the site and the routes that we're sending are also only the routes from the site. Uh, unless, of course, your topology, you know, needs a default route or something uh, from a hub uh, sent out um, from that perspective. But in any case, at all costs, we obviously want to keep this routing uh, symmetric so that we don't end up with issues. So first, let's go to West and take a look here. So what are we advertising to the SD-WAN? Well, anything we learn from BGP and anything we learn locally. If we look at the West, uh, again, it's going to be the same. We applied this via the template we created. So in this scenario, if I was to go to the BGP itself, and I was to take a look at the route map associated with our core inbound we're sending anything with a BGP source setting the local preference to 100 and allowing it in the outbound direction we're essentially allowing anything that we receive down to the core. So in this scenario, this would be the BGP data that we're sending to the core. This would be the BGP data that we're receiving from the core. So to begin at this point, we would want to either modify this or add additional rules. Um, we obviously don't want to just accept all BGP and send it on and let the uh, SD-WAN route map forward it. So here, I'll go ahead and just modify this rule. We'll put in the prefix for 74024, permit that guy. And on the other side, we will do the same. Update that. Apply it. And let's see what that did for us here. So if we look at our routes local here, we used to see this 105 route from south, but we also used to see it from the core. That is no longer the case. On west, we only see it from south. Did it fix our issue at south? Yes, right? We're no longer learning our local route from the west site. So that route map took care of that and fixed that. Now, the next thing is what about the core, right? We are advertising that uh, network down to the core as well, that 105 network. And keep in mind, uh, back to the asymmetric routing conversation, that if for whatever reason um, the this router feels that this secondary, what I'll call secondary Silver Peak, is the right path out. Um, traffic at this point from this site is going to come across the SD-WAN into the primary, down to the core, 
up to the secondary and back across. Uh, and of course, we want to avoid that at any cost, uh, so we will take a look at that as well. And with BGP, we have a whole slew of different uh, ways we can handle that. Um, I can, of course, come over here to the secondary and in my BGP route map inbound, sorry, outbound, we're going to the core, I can always say that if I've learned it from SD-WAN BGP, AS prepend, and at that point, I have tagged those routes to the core to make this look less desirable than the other. Of course, I could also do a number of things in the core, uh, setting local preference, etc. Uh, again, this is all you know more BGP stuff than SD WAN stuff and, and routing things. So, um, in this case, if we go look at the core. When we open this up here, we can see today that 105 route is headed to 74.1, which of course is what we are calling our primary. If I look at show IP BGP, I can see that the 105 is now being prepended so that it, of course, is not going to win. Um, unless, of course, the uh, primary silver peak goes down in that scenario. So, uh, in this case, you know, I handled all of my BGP related uh, configurations on the silver peaks. Um, you could, of course, handle them in the core, um, whatever works best in your environment from that perspective. So, the last thing we need to do is take a look at how the south site sees the networks at west. Uh, if we recall, uh, we advertised manually this 76 network static previously. And when we did that, we of course set a metric of 50 and 60. Um, if we look at our locally connected network, right, that being the network between the silver peaks and the core that we're advertising, we see they're both 50 um, and the same. Uh, if we see the 75 network um, from West, we see yet again, we're learning it from both Silver Peaks, but it's the same. Uh, again, I want to give one clear winner here, so I am going to do a number of things. Uh, and again, I guess I should mention most all of this with the route maps, etc., can be done with templates and um, simplified. I'm doing this manually here, but uh, on West, West 1, if I go to my routes, edit this, my metric for automatically added routes, that would be this one, I'm going to set this up to 60. And at that point, when I go look over at the cell site, I should now see that 74 has jumped to 60. Keep in mind with templates, because I have them assigned, it will reapply. So what I just did would ultimately get overridden. Um, I would need to, of course, create a template for uh, West 1 with that default value if I'm setting that value in the template, which I am. Um, so. Uh, you know, uh, be, be careful of what you change local, uh, as, you know, the template could easily just overwrite it and put it back to what it was, um, which would be the case in this scenario. Um, as far as the other network goes, if we look at our route map, BGP local, what we'll see here is anything in uh, orange here is what is being pushed from Orchestrator. So I can't edit this or do anything with it. Um, again, 
in this scenario, if I create a BGP, set this metric to 80, I guess, in this case, because 70 is the default over there, it is going to show up in black. That is a local override in this scenario. So if I apply this, and now go back over to south, we should see here our 75 network now jump to 80. And we've got one clear winner in the primary west site to get that traffic to. So um, in this case, we should be completely symmetric across the board and ready to go. So we gave this some time, let it set, and I wanted to come back and show you um, if we look at our routes on west, what we'll notice is, sure enough, that flip back to 50, right? That template came back behind me and fixed my mistake, of course, uh, which wasn't really a mistake. If we look at the BGP side and we look at the uh, route map that we made modification to here, what we will see is this state, right? So I added the, or made modification to it, and it did indeed stay. But that just to prove that you have to be very careful um, when using templates. Uh, if you need to fix an issue, you know, jumping in and just making the change uh, to the device um, if there's templates applied, could come back uh, to haunt you, you know, in the next 15 minutes to half an hour, etc. So I'm going to fix this quick. If I go over to my templates, I've got this routing template here that I was using to apply um, the route information to all my silver peaks. So. Here we can see in the routes that I'm setting that to 50, and that was where the override came from. So in here, um, just to make things easy, I'm going to add a new template called routing secondary. I'll save that. And in here, we will add our routes and our route redistribution maps. This guy I will set to 60. Save that. Notice I'm not sending it to any appliances. On the route redistribution map side, I would want to choose my SD-WAN fabric create a new map, and I'll just call it secondary, add a rule, BGP, metric 80. So now if it comes in via BGP, I'm going to set it to metric 80 before setting it out onto the SD WAN. I will also need to add a rule in here for local static. Set that to 60. Now again, I'm this is just a uh, safety net, so to speak. Uh, I've already taken care of this, but. Um, in this scenario, I want to make sure that uh, I set that here as well. Save that. Then, as far as my BGP inbound and outbound, I've got to create maps for those as well. So, um, in this scenario, I would create the inbound route map 
uh, that I created before. Um, I'll just call it secondary in PGP. zero and then save that BGP outbound we'll create one for oops out and a rule for SD WAN PGP AS prepend one and then we'll allow local static and save that. So I was obviously very specific on a per site basis with this, right? In a, a larger network, um, you know, creating templates, you, you know, we want to be a little more generalized and make sure that what we do here makes sense uh, and is able to be applied across, you know, uh, a number of silver peaks as opposed to just one. Um, so. You know, the routing, uh, again, is a, a pretty big deal. And, you know, in this scenario where I am uh, on my BGP inbound, specifically identifying uh, the subnet local to this site, why that would kind of, you know, ruin that for other sites um, or, or make it you know, non-usable for other sites. But uh, for the sake of my lab and showing, you know, how this works, uh, this will be all right. Um, now that I've created that uh, template, what I'll want to do is apply it. So in here, we will go to Apply Template Groups. On Silver Peak 1 West, we can see that our routing group is currently applied. We want to remove that, and we want to add the secondary routing. So we can see over here, we're removing routing. We're adding secondary routing. I'll hit Apply here, and we'll start to see that deploy. And now that that's deployed, let's go take a look at what we've done. So routes here, if I edit this guy, we should see this is set to 60. That's good. I forgot to apply the route map. So um, if we go back to the templates again and we take a look at our routing secondary, You'll notice here under routes that I did not set that. So we'll update that, save it, and again in this case now we're editing it. It's already tied to the appliance. It's going to go ahead and push that. Now that that's pushed, let's go take a look again and see if we fix our issue here. Yeah, now we've got secondary. So if we look at that route map, we can see this is coming from uh, Orchestrator, metric of 80, local metric 60. Back here, any of the automatically added routes based on these two settings here are set to 60. If we go look at our BGP and we take a look at those, we should see in here that our route maps are still using the old route maps, right? We created new ones, but because this is on a specific peer, uh, we don't have the ability to push this specifically with template. So in this scenario, I want secondary in and secondary out. I'll have to set this uh, local to the appliance and update that. Once we save that, we should be all fixed up there. Now, again, in a typical deployment, you know, all of this would be templatized and it would be correct um, just to make sure that, again, standardization and that uh, we have consistency across the board. 
So that covers off on all of our redundancy uh, for the west site. Now we've got to turn our focus to the south site where we will run into some additional changes and additional HA uh, scenarios. So let's head to the south here. If we remember all the way back to our first video uh, where we talked about the circuits that came into south and we realized that they did not get delivered with WAC 29s facing us. They were WAC 30s. So this scenario over here where we've got both silver peaks connected to the internet no longer works. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I specifically set that up that way so that I could show this facet of the Silver Peak. Um, first, we obviously have to go through the initial setup, but essentially what we're going to be doing here is uh, what Silver Peak refers to as Edge HA. Uh, we'll end up bringing in one ISP to each Silver Peak, but still being able to utilize them both and have a level of redundancy. So, first things first, as we did before, we need to get this Silver Peak set up and configured. I am going to configure it for the secondary circuit. All of this I've already done. My deployment config, I'll again, in this case, go to single internet branch. On the LAN side, 192.168.104.3.24, again, my IP scheme is kind of messed up here. Oops, that's two. On the other side, And I just realized something here uh, as well. We can't have the same public IP on multiple silver peaks here. Um, it will cause issues. So before I do this, I'm first going to go into deployment at south. Oops. And we're going to remove that secondary interface altogether. That way, we know we don't have IP overlap and tunnels don't get confused about where they need to connect. So now, we'll do this again. Just here, single in that branch. Seven meg circuit. Not seven. Stateful plus snap. I don't want to turn this up yet. Get off that. Twenty meg. Go back. Nothing here yet. That all looks good. And we'll apply that. Now that that is done, we'll need to come back over here and modify our connectivity. So this will no longer come into here. We'll delete that connection. I'll pull this guy over here. And we'll bring this into E1 here, which should be way in one. Then we will get rid of this management interface. I don't need that anymore. And we'll check it what's going on here. So over here in Orchestrator now, we see this appliance is up. 
It's got everything it needs. We haven't turned up any WAN labels yet, um, but otherwise it looks to be good. So now the next piece is the Edge H8 piece. So in here, um, if we go to the deployment tab of South, we can see there is a checkbox for Edge HA Connect. As soon as I click it, it gives me a whole bunch of information about the uh, uh, Edge HA. And now I need to choose my peer, which of course is going to be South 1. And then we need to identify what the HA link is going to be between the two. So in my scenario, um, you know, you can use any interface here. I'm just going to use WAN1 knowing that I already assigned MAC addresses to that interface here. Um, it automatically will assign a uh, network uh, that's going to be in use between these two appliances and it shows obviously the rest of the data here. Um, before I go ahead and do that I'm going to get these links connected so in this scenario I need to of course create the cross connect and when one should be my E2. And I'll save that. Come back over here and hit save. So now what we're going to see is these two appliances show um, an HA link between them. Uh, if I go look at the deployment now for either one of those, it's going to look a little different. Um, obviously, we have all of these. Uh, uh, it shows both in the same. Um, the next thing I also need to do here is turn up HiNet2 labels and save that. So that's pretty much it for Edge HA. Now, obviously, um, if I go back over, I'd still need to get my BGP relationship uh, with the core and all of my route maps in place. But essentially, what this allows the Silver Peak to do is treat each of these WAN links as though it's directly connected to both, even though physically it is not. So uh, traffic uh, coming into the primary silver peak via that BGP, uh, knowing that it's preferred, uh, is going to drop traffic across that cross connect uh, to use the INET2 label um, and vice versa if needed to come back across to the other one. So uh, we maintain redundancy. Um, again, if a silver peak dies, yes, of course, we lose that ISP link. Um, but we, we are still fully redundant uh, out to the internet in that scenario. Uh, 